I think you should see full screen now. Yes, fantastic. Yeah, it works very well. Okay, so <clears throat> the first speaker, the first speaker of our first session, is uh, Roberto Bercacci from CISA, and uh, he's going to talk about progress with uh, metric affine and four derivative uh, gravity. Uh, please, Roberto, thank you. So, uh, thanks, Luca and uh, Salavan, and uh, to all the organizers. Uh, first of all, for convening this meeting, uh, which is uh, it's very useful to have such online meetings uh, in this uh, while we cannot uh, meet in person. And then specifically for inviting me to talk about my work. Uh, so I will uh, talk about, uh, say something general about metric defined gravity and four derivative gravity and also mention some work I did uh, on this uh, in the last uh, few years with uh, Ergin Sesgin, Kevin Falls, Nobuyoshi Ota, Alessio Baldazzi and Luca Zambelli. So what I call four derivative gravity is the same thing that uh, John calls a quadratic gravity. So here are my conventions. And I'm sticking to old fashioned nomenclature where the coefficient of y square is called one over two lambda and the coefficient of r square is one over xi. Uh, then there's the Euler term here, the topological invariant. And uh, please note that I use a z Newton for the inverse of a Newton uh, constant. So that's the Hilbert term in the action. So that's uh, for derivative gravity, whereas uh, metric affine gravity is a theory of gravity where the connection is also treated as an independent variable. And uh, so we're all familiar with the uh, Palatini theory, uh, which has a, a Lagrangian that is linear in curvature and an independent connection. And in that case, uh, uh, it's the, equa the equation of motion just tells you that the connection is equal to uh, the Levi-Civita connection. But uh, when I talk about metric affine gravity, I talk more generally about theories where uh, the connection has really a, a dynamics of its own and it can propagate. Uh, and uh, my notation is the following. I, for the Levi-Civita connection, I use the notation that is uh, familiar in gravity. So the connection coefficients are called gamma. These are the Christoffel symbols, basically. The covariant derivative is denoted nabla and the curvature is the Riemann tensor and it's denoted R. Uh, whereas for the independent dynamical connection, I use A for the coefficients, uh, D for the covariant derivative and F for the curvature. So this is the notation that is usually used in uh, young mills theories. And also a remark, I use the same name for uh, a certain geometric object in any frame independent. So for example, uh, the, connect the coefficients of the independent connection in a, a coordinate frame are A mu rho sigma, and the coefficients in an orthonormal frame are a mu a b. I use the same name a for the for these objects because it's the same uh, geometric object. Anyway, uh, there is a very close uh, relationship between metric affine gravity and uh, four derivative gravity, uh, which goes as follows: Given an independent connection and a metric, well, out of the metric you can construct a Levi-Civita connection, and then you can write a. a as a Levi-Civita connection plus a tensor. And then you can write uh, the curvature of uh, A uh, as the curvature of the Levi-Civita connection plus uh, covariant derivative of this tensor and tensor squared. Now the typical Lagrangian of metric affine gravity has uh, terms linear and quadratic in uh, the curvature tensor. And if you insert this uh, uh, decomposition, you will find uh, terms linear in R, quadratic in R, and, uh, and then you will have uh, terms uh, that contain covariant derivative of phi squared, a mass term for phi, and interaction terms, cubic quartic interaction and non-minimal interactions of this field phi with uh, the Riemann tensor. So you see the first uh, two terms here in, this, uh, in these two lines are just uh, the action of uh, four derivative gravity. 
And then there is, in addition, uh, a tensor field uh, phi that you can think of as some kind of matter field. So you can, if you want, uh, think of metric affine gravity as four derivative gravity plus some uh, uh, slightly exotic uh, matter field. Now uh, let's put a bit uh, more indices on on this. Uh, and this here I've uh, just shown you schematically the structure of the Lagrangian. Uh, and of course, I'm ignoring the fact that there are indices and there are many, many ways of contracting the indices. So uh, you have the, the metric. And uh, if you work with, uh, now you're not bound to work with uh, coordinate frames. You could uh, decide to work with uh, general frames. Uh, and the general frame I'm going to call theta, this theta here, theta a nu. Uh, then the, there are two uh, more geometric objects in this uh, in metric affine gravity, which are the covariant exterior derivative of the frame field, this is the torsion, and the covariant derivative of the metric, this is called uh, non-metricity. So torsion n, uh, so gener general connection A uh, will have uh, both torsion and non-metricity. Uh, then you see that uh, these two fields are covariant derivatives of some other object, which is either the frame field or, uh, and or the metric field. If you choose to work with particular coordinate systems, uh, sorry, with particular uh, bases in your tangent spaces. Uh, these uh, formulas specialize. So if you work with uh, coordinate bases, theta a mu becomes a uh, delta a mu, and the torsion becomes just an algebraic object. But Q still involves derivatives. If you work with orthonormal frames, uh, the metric becomes eta a b, the Minkowski metric. And then uh, non-metricity becomes an algebraic object. and uh, portion uh, still contains derivatives of the field. But uh, in general, uh, these fields theta and g, mm, in a sense, can play in this uh, theory a role that is close to that of ghost on bosons. As a matter of fact, um, the torsion, uh, theta and g are nonlinear objects. Uh, theta has been, is, is bound to be non-degenerate, and so it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with elements of the linear group. And the metric is bound to have a certain signature, also to be non-degenerate, and the eigenvalues have to have a certain signature. And therefore, the metric itself can be is a, an object that has values in some corset space of the linear group. So you can think of these as uh, um, ghost on bosons. And torsion and non-metricity are just the covariant derivatives of these uh, ghost on bosons. So it's very natural then to just have uh, terms in the action that contain these kinetic terms for uh, theta and g. And so these would be terms that are, have either, that are either quadratic in T or in Q uh, or mixed terms TQ. These terms will have uh, by dimensional analysis a prefactor that has a dimension of mass squared. And so you see that uh, now if you assume that uh, the ground state of this theory is flat space, which has f and t and q all equal to zero, then you can go to a particular gauge where the ground state is represented by theta is one and gamma is equal to the Minkowski flat metric. And then, uh, and, and then in this case, t and q are just uh, linear in the gauge field, so that these, uh, this ghost on boson Lagrangian becomes just a mass term for the, for the gauge field. So this is a, a form of a gravitational Higgs phenomenon where the independent connection A really becomes massive because of the presence of these uh, terms in the Lagrangian. Uh, so just like uh, in ordinary uh, Higgs phenomenon in particle physics, uh, the uh, kinetic term of the Goldstone boson is what becomes a mass for the uh, gauge field. Also, the same happens here. There is a, a more general and more covariant way of seeing this, which uh, uh, um, 
which is based on this decomposition of A into gamma plus pi, because uh, you can also decompose the torsion of A as uh, the torsion of gamma, which is zero, plus something linear in phi, and the non-matricity as a non-matricity of gamma, which is zero, plus something which is linear in phi. So all together, T and Q are just uh, linear combinations of the uh, components of this tensor phi. And therefore, in any state and in any gauge, this uh, kinetic, uh, these uh, terms in the action proportional to torsion square and uh, non matricity square are nothing but uh, a mass term for this uh, independent tensor uh, phi. So you see, uh, the Palatini term also contributes to this mass. And so it's natural to assume that uh, these masses are all of the order of the Planck mass. It would be interesting if some of the states uh, remained uh, uh, very light, uh, but uh, perhaps this is uh, just not something that one would expect. So if they are all very heavy, it means that uh, for us, uh, that we are uh, seeing only low energy physics, uh, it's as if they were infinitely massive and therefore basically uh, the field phi is zero. And that is equivalent to say the torsion and non-matricity are zero. And that is equivalent to say that the independent connection is equal to the Levi-Civita connection. But now it's not necessarily the consequence of the field equation as in Palatini formalism. This is just a, uh, what happens naturally at low energy when you have a, a massive, uh, massive modes. And the result is completely, actually is completely independent of the detailed form of the action. So this is a kind of gravitational phenomenon. And we can think of uh, Einstein gravity as the low energy remnant of uh, uh, this Higgs phenomenon happening near the Planck scale. So I'm mentioning this because uh, it uh, uh, puts a, a different emphasis on uh, the kind of question that one would naturally ask. So here it is the metric or the frame field that acts as all the parameters. And uh, therefore the natural, the central question should be why is there a metric that is non-zero? Uh, in other words, why is the symmetry broken rather than being unbroken? And that's a very difficult question on which uh, I will have nothing more to say here, but uh, I think that uh, uh, it's uh, something that we ought to think about, perhaps a little more. So now, just uh, if we now think just of the broken phase, uh, as I said, it's described by these fields A and uh, by the metric. And the field A has three indices, and so in principle it could carry um, states uh, with spin up to three. So you can have, a, actually, if it's uh, completely generic, it will contain a lot of particles with spins three, two, one, zero, and different parity. And uh, which ones of these states propagate depends on the coefficient in the action. Uh, a typical action in, the, uh, in this theory could contain terms quadratic in F, terms quadratic in T and Q, as I said earlier, and, uh, and the term linear in F. Um, a systematic analysis of this uh, Lagrangian is, is very complicated. So in the case where Q is equal to zero, it had been done by Seskin and von Neuenhausen in uh, 1980. Uh, so they uh, systematized uh, this and uh, looked for classes of theories that were free of ghosts and tachyons. Uh, the general analysis uh, with, uh, of the theory with non-metricity too uh, requires the use of spin projectors for three index tensors, which uh, were not available until recently. And so we developed this with uh, Ergin uh, last year. And uh, we have then some uh, new results for the case t equal to zero, which is complementary to the case q equal to zero that had been studied uh, in the past. So in this case, uh, still there are, so even putting t equal to zero reduces the number of uh, coefficients, but not enough to really 
make this uh, 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 something that you can study in full generality. So we make some uh, additional requirements. We demand a projective invariance, and we demand that uh, the spin three does not propagate, and that there's only one spin two uh, state that propagates, which uh, is going to be the gravity. So these requirements uh, restrict the action to a six parameter family. So now you have two parameters that are these C7, C11, which are coefficients of S F squared now. Then there's a Palatini term here. And there are four more parameters uh, in, uh, that are masses, essentially. So it turns out that uh, in this class of theories, if you impose certain inequalities on the couplings, uh, the theory will be ghost and tachyon free. So there is here a, a six parameter family of uh, theories which do not have ghost and tachyons. And they contain only the graviton plus uh, massive particles with spin two, but parity minus the opposite of the usual graviton. And then one uh, uh, spin one plus and one spin minus state, all of these masses. So when you convert this Lagrangian to uh, G5 variables, you will see that it contains no R squared terms, which may be the, uh, which is, well, they better, it better not contain R squared terms because otherwise it would have ghosts. Um, but uh, so this can, be, these actions can be thought of as Einstein gravity plus some, uh, tensor field phi or a particular type now. And because it's Einstein gravity, it's not normalizable. So these theories don't have ghosts or tachyons, but they are non renormalizable. And this uh, in accordance with uh, all the folklore. Uh, I'd be delighted to tell you some results for these metric affine gravities. Uh, that involved uh, quantum properties, but uh, there's very precious little known about, about them at the quantum level, in particular not uh, about the behavior of the curvature squared term. So this is something for the future. I will just summarize what uh, I said so far by saying that uh, I think that metric affine gravity is attractive because uh, it uh, makes uh, gravity much uh, more similar to the uh, other theories that we are familiar with uh, in particle physics or theories of the other interactions. And the uh, central question then is related to the origin of the Planck scale, Planck mass, and uh, what the generation of the vacuum expectation value for the metric. The unpleasant feature of these theories is that they have a large number of free parameters, actually, many more than those that I have uh, displayed uh, for you here. And uh, but uh, there remain a virgin, almost virgin territory for uh, exploration of quantum properties. Uh, let me now uh, come to uh, the second part of the things that I wanted to say, uh, namely uh, for derivative gravity. This is just a little summary of things that are well known to uh, all of you at this meeting. Uh, now, here are the beta functions that. Uh, for the couplings uh, lambda psi and rho that were, had been computed by Avramidian Barvinsky back in 1985. Uh, let's forget the ghost. I want to say something about uh, all derivative gravity from the point of view of asymptotic safety. There's going to be a, a, a whole session on asymptotic safety tomorrow, but uh, today I just want to perhaps make some connection between the research on asymptotic safety and uh, the perturbative work on high derivative gravity. So there have been several calcula uh, well, in uh, asymptotic safety, one tries to, one computes the beta functions of uh, couplings in the theory and uh, looks for fixed points. Uh, 
And the tool that is uh, mostly used is this functional renormalization group equation that allows you to uh, <clears throat> follow the flow in principle of uh, infinitely many couplings. But uh, without going to infinitely many couplings, you can truncate uh, uh, the theory to a particular, your uh, effective, your running action to a particular form. And so I'm going to concentrate now on uh, taking the action of uh, uh, for derivative gravity as an ansatz for this uh, running effective action. So there have been uh, several calculations uh, in. Uh, using the functional normalization group. Uh, and they are of two types, really. Uh, in one type, uh, we, uh, one just looks at the uh, functional RG at uh, one loop, in a one loop approximation. And one, what one gets then is uh, the following. One, you can reproduce the, these beta functions that are well known for the dimensionless couplings. And in addition, you get some beta functions for Newton coupling and for the topological term. And those have a non-trivial fixed point. So while these couplings here remain asymptotically free, uh, Newton coupling has a non-trivial fixed point. And then on the other hand, you can try to apply the functional RG uh, in its full uh, uh, strength uh, beyond one loop. And there was calculation by uh, Benedetti, Machado, and Zauresig some time ago, where they found a non-trivial fixed point for all the couplings. So none of them uh, was uh, had a zero. They were all non-zero at the fixed point. Now, the uh, um, the shortcoming of this last calculation was that it's just made on an Einstein background, which uh, doesn't allow you to disentangle all three uh, high derivative couplings. You can only get two beta functions um, for them. And so then recently we tried to compute uh, all three beta functions from the FRG beyond the one loop approximation. This is a work with Kevin Falls and uh, Nobu Ota. And uh, just because of technical difficulties, we uh, expand, we limited ourselves to a first order expansion in Zn. And remember, Zn is the inverse of Newton coupling. So we are expanding here for, it's a strong uh, coupling in Newton constant, if you wish. And then the beta functions we got, uh, neglecting now for the moment the cosmological constant, which makes everything far, far more complicated. But uh, if we just forget about it, uh, you see that we, uh, well, here you have. The, the first term in each line here is the universal beta function of Avramidi and Barvinsky. And then there are corrections proportional to Zn here. And then, of course, there is in addition a beta function for Z itself. And so these beta functions have se several fixed points, but most of them are probably fake. They are uh, artifacts of the truncations and of the approximations. Uh, the ones that uh, seem uh, reasonable enough are the first three in this list. The first uh, corresponds to having lambda and psi asymptotically free. They go to zero in this ratio 0 0.02286, which was already known uh, since the 80s. But now we have a non-trivial fixed point for Z. Uh, which also uh, its inverse is a fixed point for G. Uh, it has some value here, which is two point, and for the cosmological constant. Then, in, so this uh, presumably has to be identified with the fixed point uh, that uh, we talk about uh, in four derivative gravity. And then there are fully non-trivial fixed points. Now, the scaling exponents for FP1 are just the classical dimensions, which uh, shows that this is really a Gaussian fixed point. Uh, it corresponds to a free theory. And the, other two, the others are non-trivial. But notice that of the three uh, classically dimensionless couplings, uh, one remains always marginal. This is the coefficient of the Euler term. 
uh, whereas one becomes relevant and one becomes irrelevant. So this leaves us with several unanswered questions. Uh, the, the most pressing one being how can we flow from the ultraviolet fixed point to the perturbative gravity regime? And then uh, there's also a question, which one of these fixed points should we trust? And then uh, also we would like to see a relation to the perturbative analysis. So in the remaining couple of minutes, I will uh, just uh, make some comments about this. In the functional RG, we have to choose a regulator that suppresses the low momentum modes. Uh, and it typically is a function with a shape like the one shown here. And normally it is chosen to be normalized so that uh, when momentum is zero, the function is one. But one can vary the normalization. Let, let me call A the overall normalization. And it is, uh, in fact, uh, technically useful often to study how things depend on this parameter A. And in particular, we were now interested in looking at the limit A going to zero. We call this vanishing regulator. So these regulators uh, are infrared regulator, but in the flow equation, they also regulate the ultraviolet uh, uh, end of the momentum integrals. And if you let them go to zero, uh, you may expect that certain quantities will blow up and this actually happens. And for that reason, it may be necessary uh, to introduce an additional separate regulator in, in those cases. And so here we could uh, uh, construct a two parameter family of regulators depending on A and another regulator parameter epsilon, uh, such that for when epsilon is zero and A is equal to one, so in this corner of, of this plane, this is the regulator that we use uh, usually in functional normalization group calculations. On the other hand, if you let, uh, uh, if you take the limit first A going to zero and then epsilon going to zero, you will find that uh, in this way you reproduce the beta functions of dimensional regularization. So there is a, a way of sort of uh, continuously connecting uh, these calculations. And so I will anticipating some uh, result that is still uh, unpublished. Uh, I can tell you what happens if we try to uh, take the limit A to zero here without epsilon actually, in the case of a high derivative gravity. So the fixed point FP1 uh, has a very good A to zero limit where lambda and xi remain asymptotically free and they go to zero in, in this ratio 2286, which is uh, independent, it remains independent of A. And the fixed point FP2 and FP3 seem to persist in the limit A to zero, whereas other fixed points disappear much sooner, which probably confirms that uh, they are unphysical. So interesting, in any cases, uh, G will go to infinity when you take the limit A to zero, like one over A log A. And uh, lambda star will go like one over log A, uh, it goes to zero like that. So in some sense, this should accord with uh, what is seen in dimensional regularization because in dimensional regularization, you wouldn't see a fixed point for G uh, what we see here is, is perhaps a little bit more precise. We see that uh, there is a fixed point at g equal to infinity. And the fixed point at g equal to infinity simply means that uh, the, the coefficient of the Einstein term is zero. So it means that not having a fixed, uh, an Einstein term in the action is a fixed point. Okay, so uh, very quick summary is that uh, of this part, expanding the action, so the flow equations to first, first order in one over G will produce three non-trivial fixed points. And now physically you may interpret these fixed points either the, so the non-trivial fixed points, either the final endpoint of an RG trajectory, or it, they could be an intermediate step towards asymptotic freedom. Uh, both scenarios are possible. 
And I hope that in the future, this uh, uh, taking this limit of vanishing regulators can be uh, can make uh, more uh, can help establish more connections between what we do in asymptotic safety and what uh, people do with uh, uh, in perturbative approaches. So thanks very much. Thank you, Roberto. And uh, yeah, congratulations. You took precisely 30 minutes. So <laughs> you're very precise. So yeah, okay. We have uh, two questions, one from Philip and one from uh, Tejinder Singh. So Philip, maybe you can start. Yes, um, Roberto, very nice. Um, you can maybe answer the following concern of mine. When Weil first considered unification of gravity and electromagnetism, he looked for the covariant derivative of the metric to be equal to the vector potential. And Einstein objected on the grounds that then a particle's previous history would be important in knowing what it's doing at any given moment, because you don't have matricity. Now, when you make the Palatini approach and you use the connection as the dynamical variable, other than for Einstein-Hilbert itself, you don't get that the Palatini, that, that the connection in the solution is Levi-Civita. So therefore you'll always lose matricity. Um, maybe you have a way to solve that, but is that not something you should be concerned about? Uh, so this, uh, I know that uh, this issue of, uh, that was raised by Einstein, um, in fact, uh, it's, uh, you see, it's not a problem because this, uh, precisely because the connection is very massive, presumably it has Planck mass, uh, and so the effects that it gives rise are, are negligible. And this has been, uh, you can find uh, an explicit discussion of this in some papers by Gilenchea, Dumitru Gilenchea, uh, who's been uh, rather active uh, in, uh, on this topic. Uh, more generally, yes, the, the Weil theory, is, yes, it is just a, a particular case of metric affine gravity. Uh, and it's a nice, uh, it's a nice uh, special system to study, since given that the general system is so complicated, we need uh, uh, to look at uh, special systems first. Okay. Um... Singh, please. Uh, maybe there is another question by Singh. Okay. Yeah, hi, Roberto. Uh, we exchanged some emails. Nice to meet you here. Uh, this is Tejinder Singh, yeah. Uh, I had a question about the Planck scale Higgs phenomenon that you mentioned for emergence of gravitation. Uh, there have been some uh, studies recently reporting a left-right uh, Higgs representation in this left-right symmetric extension of the standard model, which include a SU2 right. And when this SU2R is broken, uh, the standard Higgs is restored. Uh, could this be related to the Higgs phenomenon at the Planck scale that you have been talking about? Uh, these are probably very different models. Uh, yeah, I think... Uh... You are referring to the uh, Pati Salam uh, left-right yes. symmetric unification, yes. and that yes. Yes. Uh, that may happen at uh, well at high energies, but uh, also much much lower than the Planck energy. So uh, I think it's uh, uh, something unrelated. Uh, the symmetry that is broken by the Higgs uh, by this uh, gravitational Higgs phenomenon is uh, um, well depending on what you start with, it's either the uh, general linear uh, group uh, that acts on uh, frames at a point in the tangent space, or uh, the Lorentz group, uh, the Lorentz subgroup. If you start with uh, non-metricity equal to zero, uh, so it would be the Lorentz group that is uh, broken. Uh, and now I realize that I may cause confusion because uh, I, I may uh, some people may be alarmed uh, by, uh, by the statement that uh, Lorentz symmetry is broken. But this is uh, breaking in the sense of Higgs phenomenon. Uh, yeah, the, but this could, broken. it could be related to the gravity weak discussion we had. Uh, 
I'm trying to think of uh, the law, uh, the Lawrence weak sector breaking from the strong electro sector, and that itself being responsible for the emergence of uh, the metric and gravity. Uh, yeah, but that is uh, another story that uh, I didn't discuss here. So, uh, so okay. what? Yeah. Yeah. 